Collaboration between architect and designer can be a wonderful experience, bringing out the best in two talents and resulting in a home better than either could have created on their own. But the relationship can also be fraught if visions conflict, budgets are disputed, and creativity is questioned. So what makes for a successful collaboration? How do you ensure harmony and a shared purpose so that all those involved in a project come away happy, especially the client? I have with me two top practitioners, an architect and an interior designer who have worked together, as well as with an array of other talents, to talk about what makes for a successful architect-designer pairing, how to ensure working together is successful, and what to avoid at all costs. Gil Schaefer III is one of America's most acclaimed residential architects. Since founding his firm in 2002, he has designed homes and apartments around the country and abroad, in scales ranging from under 1,000 square feet to nearly 40,000 square feet, and in styles ranging from Georgian to Colonial Revival to Shingle style. The grandson and great-great-grandson of architects, he was exposed to life in a variety of places, including the Midwest, the Northeast, Georgia, California, and the Bahamas, which gave him an early understanding of how architectural traditions and lifestyle are influenced by location and context. He's the author of two best-selling books, The Great American House and A Place to Call Home. His work has been published in virtually every shelter magazine, and he has collaborated with top designers ranging from Bunny Williams and Miles Red to Rita Koning, Markham Roberts, and my other guest today, David Netto. Hello, Gil. Hey, how are you? Good. Thanks for being here. Delighted. David Netto grew up in New York, surrounded by taste and immersed in the world of design. His father owned the fabric house Cowton and Tout. From an early age, he was interested in architecture, furniture, and cars and their history. After dropping out of Harvard Architecture School, he founded his studio in New York in 2000 and is known for bringing to modernism a touch of warmth and personality and to traditionalism, youthful energy and a dash of the exotic. Projects have been published in virtually every major shelter magazine, and he has designed a collection of modern children's furniture inspired by his two daughters. He's also a writer and has contributed to The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, and Town and & Country, among others. And he has written a monograph on Francois Catru and is currently working on the text for a book on Stephen Sills, due this fall, as well as on a book of his own work. Welcome, David. Nice to see you, Michael. Great. I'm so glad and that Gil. you're both here and you've agreed to do this. I've heard from so many designers over the years complaining that architects, you know, will get the null lion's share of a budget on a project. I've heard architects complaining that designers don't appreciate what they do. So I would love to get a sense. And like, Gil, let's start with you. What do you think makes for a successful collaboration with designer? Because you've worked with so many top talents. Mm. Well, I, I think I think um, being sort of in the same uh, mindset is is a big help. I think that uh, if you're if you come from too far apart, in two different places, it's it's difficult because your vision is not going to be enough in sync um, that it. It's probably not going to work too well. I mean, I think I think there's they don't have to be I identical because that would be really boring. But uh, and I think that what's interesting about when David and I work together is that we we each come from our own corners, as it were. But but when we push together, uh, it, it makes for something more interesting than if we had probably tried to do it on our own. Um, so. And. David, what about you? And at what point do you think it's important that the architect and designer start working together? How early on? Um, I would let me just back into something that occurred to me while Gil was talking, because our collaborations can be, uh, you know, with friction. I mean, there, there, there's a certain amount of complete different point of view about things that we have, in addition to the common ground that we absolutely also have. One thing we share is we have a real um, appreciation of history and a knowledge of history that, that was actually the beginning of our friendship was based around finishing each other's sentences in the firm where I worked, you know, as the sort of intern and Gil was already a major uh, architect. But um we bonded over our love of history initially. And what I was going to say is when you're different, it makes you have to make arguments on behalf of an idea that you really have to be on your game when you have to convince someone of something that you may feel 
already without language is the right decision, you know, right direction. But when I have to talk Gil into something, I get to sit down and really think, because he's fair, right? You know, I mean, he's, he's not a fanatic. He can be convinced. Um, and I have to think, do I really care about this the way I think it, I care about this? It, it's good for, for the opposing uh, design force in that you have to really consider your commitment to doing that. When you have to talk someone into it, you have to be on your game, which also means you have to believe in what you're saying. And, and I um, think friction is important to any collaboration. You know, there's always going to be points of contention, but it's how you work them out. Um, well, and how you discover something that neither of you knew you wanted in the working out right, right. of of those ideas. And, and I'll say, David, to your credit, you, and you allude to this, but you're, you're incredibly articulate about an idea and why you want to do it. And, and you always come with uh, a drawing that you've done, a sketch or something, and a photograph of three things from history and why it's relevant, why it's appropriate to what we're trying to do. Because uh, we're, I'm always sort of grounding it in bones of something in tradition. And, and you're, trying to say, okay, that's great, but let's shake it up a little bit. And so you, when you're trying to convince me, you're showing me why it works within the bones of the thing that I'm trying to hold sacred to some degree. Thank you for noticing. <laughs> <laughs> now, Gil, have you ever had a client say to you, oh, I'm going to hire X designer. We're going to work on this, but I'm hiring X designer. And you you say, oh my God, no, that's never going to work. Has that ever <laughs> um, arisen? I, I, I don't know that that's... Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know that that's happened exactly, but um, because usually because of the nature of my work, the people that are brought to the table make sense within that realm somehow. Um, uh, I, I am working on something where the, where the client wanted some, an interior designer that was sort of out of left field. And for me, um, and that was actually really, really interesting um, to kind of push us together. Um, and, uh, you know, I wouldn't have guessed it on my own. I would have said, oh, let's, the two of us should work together. Um, right. And sometimes those, it's just like what David's saying about friction. Sometimes the things that are the least obvious can make something really, really interesting. So. Well, I don't think anything. I've done that with architects, but not Gil. Mm hmm. I mean, you know, you can tell if something's just a bad idea and if you're not desperate to have that job, which sometimes I have been and I've sucked it up. But, you know, if I just think this is just not, this isn't what's going to be in anybody's best interest, I've either advised that they um, consider another architect or that I step out, which, you know, I'm, I'm not some... Yeah. It's a perfectly reasonable conversation. It doesn't have to mean that anybody's having a tantrum. Right. But I, I have never met the project that Gil wouldn't make better if he was working on it. I can say in this specific conversation. Yes, but I'm sure you've worked with some less talented architects over the years. And I mean, I know that design, especially in, in New York. Well, that's like saying, you know, you've gone to the opera and you've seen somebody less talented than Callas or something. I mean, Gil is in a level. I, I, I'm not, you know, blowing smoke. Gil, Gil is at a, a, a very specific and fairly alone up there, unique level. But, you know, if you want a Japanese modern house at the beach with huge sliders that is all about expressing the horizon, you know, architecturally and Neutra is the, you know, what you want to channel, then you just would not want to work with Gil <laughs> right. because you'd want something completely different. <laughs> right, right. Totally true. But exactly. it doesn't mean that Gil's not the best at what he can do. Right, and I, and I would respectfully say to that person, yeah, I'm probably not the best, your best choice for that because there's other people that do it so much better and they should have the best, you know, for that thing. And, and so I have no problem with that either, saying that. Each of you separately, because you don't only work together, you work with lots of different architects, designers. When is the best point for you guys or to work with the other person? How early on? Because I know I've had designers say to me, oh, the architect was hired a year and a half ago and all the money is spent. You know, that's a famous designer <laughs> well, complaining well, about Well, even worse than that, the, the design is all worked out. So for the interior designer to come in and they have a completely different point of view about 
the way things should be or the way where they want the bed, where they want the bedroom. It, it's, it's, it all unravels because I, I find generally the interior designer does get their way. So I, I think it's really <laughs> important to, to be in, in the conversation at the very beginning. And David and I have always, when we've worked together, we've always worked from the get go together um, from the very, very beginning. And, and I think, and that's true. I think with every designer that, uh, I, I work with, I try to say, let's, let's get on board all of us together. We might do the first sketches, you know, that, that lay out the floor plan generally, but very early on, we want the interior designer to say, oh, no, no, no. I thought the, the views were prettier from that side or the, you know, I like the light better for this room there. And you want, you want to hear all that at the very beginning. I think, don't, what do you think, David? Don't you agree? Well, I mean, ideally, I completely agree. But the way things actually shake out, I have been attached to jobs where the architect was hired and the relationship, the sort of senior relationship between the clients and the architect had already uh, been established. And I feel that I have to show respect for that instinct on the client's part and not try to go in and turn everything upside down because there's a certain instinct that the client had in in hiring that person first. That's happening to me. I mean, on, on, an, on another job, not with Gil, with a classical architect who's a bit more um, uh, structured in, in their approach than I would have advocated being. But that is fine. That's going to be fine. Um, um, I was going to ask Gil, actually, you know, isn't it much more alarming when you don't know what's happening with the landscape huh. for for years well, or that's months a third person than involved, the decoration? Right. Because that that really is the biggest unknown in how your architecture is going to be perceived and relate to its site. And um, that must be scary. I mean, less Super so for great. me, but you yeah, know, yeah. I would think you'd be more alarmed if you didn't meet the landscape designer until the end than the decorator. Yeah, no, for sure. I think that would be... Yes, <laughs> that's pretty bad. Um, well, do you do you think that most clients understand the importance of all of this early on? Or because I I know some clients, people who have big houses, say, "Oh, I'm hiring this designer," or "I'm hiring this architect," and then say, "Oh, well, who's going to do the architecture?" And they don't they haven't thought about it. They you know so many clients are you know influenced by Instagram magazines, whatever. They want this look. But the, I, I think they don't understand the complexity of all the levels involved. Is, and is that an issue for you? How do you educate your clients, I guess, is what I'm asking. I, I, I don't know if that's for me or for Gil, but I would say that, that f the, 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 the category that most client opinions belong in is where I would put that one, which is they say they know what they want, but they don't really know what they want. And so that's not a put down. That just means that in defining our job, it's to help offer, whether we do it sideways or obliquely or gently or directly, um, our job is to advise and guide someone to the right answer, whether they think they already have it or they like their own opinion more than ours or not. You know, there are many ways psychologically that besides direct confrontation that you can influence the outcome of client thinking. And a really skilled decorator or architect, you know, whoever has the ear of the person makes their own idea better. You know, it doesn't mean you're inserting your ego about who's going to get hired. It means you know this person thinks they know what they want, but but it's your job to know things they never knew. Right, right, and make that happen, and and, and you have to kind of explain the importance of all these people involved in the project being involved early on. You have to explain it because it's not always obvious to everyone, and and you have to explain why you know it it can un unravel later if they bring in the decorator later or the landscape designer later. Um, I think it's it is super important to to explain that to them. And there might not be the personal chemistry between that person and whoever you're suggesting. You well, know, that's true. Uh, the, yeah. on paper it might seem like a great right. idea, and then you go to the meeting and it goes splat, and there's no yeah, energy right. or whatever. Right. That that's very important. That chemistry is so important, I think. And oh, you're going to spend two years together, or whatever it is, four phone calls a day for for two three years, all this money. That's a, that's got to be there. Yeah, absolutely. 
And David, you mentioned about having the client's ear. And I think that that's something that's really crucially important. But I, I know from designers I've talked to, and even architects too, that now, especially on the level that y- you work on, Gil, and, and David as well, you know, very high-end houses, big houses, that a lot of these clients are super busy, whatever. And there's arisen this thing called the client rep. And I'd love to get your take on that because the client rep is supposed to represent the client. I mean, that's by definition. But, you know, it adds a layer in between you and what the client wants or thinks they want, as you said, David, because many of us don't know what we really want. We think we know. So has that affected you, Gil? I think I've been pretty, I mean, oddly enough, most of my projects haven't had client reps. Um, But, uh, and I think you have to, be careful what who the client rep is and you don't always have a choice but there are some um the ones that i've worked with i've been pretty lucky they've they've been really good at what they do and they understand the collaborative nature of it of everything and and um are pretty fair about getting everyone's voice in there um but there are some who are really motivated by budget and time schedule <laughs> and that's kind of that's how they're heroes to the client and and that can kind of mess everything up um if they don't understand the nuances of certain design decisions so uh, you know i think you're right it can be difficult but i think um there are also really good client reps who understand how to do this well and i've been i've been pretty lucky i don't know david you um yeah david have you had this issue uh i've i've had very few intimate relationships with client reps one terrible one and i ended up getting fired from the project anyway but not by the rep it was just like more bad juju was this person and then the the project just sort of slipped away you know and um i i still have returned to that relationship and have done other houses for those clients but but that one we didn't do together um and then and then gil and i have worked a couple times with a terrific client rep owner's rep um, two weird things that are that are a quasi answer to this, but show you that I'm up for wor- working with the henchmen or you know the the intermediaries. Um, one of my favorite projects, which I've just finished, uh, was brought to me by somebody who represented themselves as being the client rep. It was a lady, um, and um, this was a small penthouse in New York, fantastic pied a terre, great great little apartment, and. Then it emerged that the lady and the client were in a relationship. And I loved the idea of that. Huh. And he was a very international guy. And to this day, having installed this thing three weeks ago, I have never met the client. And we did everything through his girlfriend, pretending that she was the owner's rep. And I codenamed the project within my office Love Nest <laughs> because nobody, everybody knew who this guy was. You know, he's easily Googleable to say the least. But we've never met him. And I just thought, you know, I would do anything for anybody in love. This is the cutest thing. They were older, you know, and uh, sort of second chance, you know, romance. And it was the most romantic and successful project. And then I finished it. And then I said, well, isn't this great? He's going to be in there for the summer, <laughs> whatever. And she said, he's not even going to show up to check it out until September. <laughs> so um, that is a, is a, is a, Situation where I did not actually ever even meet the client, let alone have a lot of communications with the client, but it ended very, very well. Well, in a sense, you you knew the client because the client rep was yeah it was really the client. The client. The client rep. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. you know, I mean, yeah, it still, was fraught it with weird risk. Removed. I never met this guy. Right. I was on right. the hook for right. hundreds of thousands right. of dollars. Right, and suppose they broke up. Suppose he didn't no, like absolutely. what he saw when he walked in there in the end. You know, right. I, it was full of risk, right. but I just decided to believe what everybody said they wanted and do my best work for them. And it's great. You know, it's, but that, that did go well. Another thing that didn't happen at all, but that was my own decision was a very well known architect that I've worked with again, not Gil, um, said that somebody they, they, they've worked with for years wanted to hire me. And I said, great, I'll talk to them. And they said, no, they don't want to talk to you yet. They, they want just to sort of put you in the pocket for this project that they're developing the design and, the, or, you know, sourcing the real estate hadn't been bought yet or something. But like, it was just kind of a mafia 
style, you know, tap on the shoulder. We'll call you when we need you. I know a guy who knows a guy or something like that. And I thought if this person's perception of what the designer client relationship should be is that he thinks he wants to hire somebody he's never even spoke to, spoken to, who, who he wants no advice from about the house. He just wants me to call me in at the last minute to hang curtains. Then I don't think I should do this because we have a completely different definition of what is the relationship and what is contingent to get the result, the desired result. So to the architect's total astonishment, I declined <laughs> the project. And, you know, I don't know how much I gave up and I probably ruined my career, but, <laughs> you know, it would have, it's the job that would have changed everything. But I just didn't like that they didn't want to meet me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I didn't like the sound of that. If you wanted to have one Zoom, I would have done it. But this whole idea of this thing happening for years outside of my purview and control, you know, I mean, suppose we met, I was attached to it, and then they hated the sound of my voice. You know, it could have all been my fault, but I knew it was a bad idea. Yeah. I, and, I, you know, did, so, go ahead. Go. I was just, I was just agreeing with David. I think you, to, to get into a job where you're that separated from the client is, is in the residential realm is, I think, a disaster. I, I think you can't. <clears throat> can't really do that job. Yeah. And I think it's a very intimate relationship being an architect well, or designer. You're taking their dreams, you're taking everything they own, everything they want, and trying to make it better and work for them and expose them to things they've never seen before. But if you don't know who they are, so... Somebody's going to do that job and somebody's sure. going to do a great job. So Gil, I sort of disagree with you that you can't do that job. Somebody who's a machine with some kind of corporate structure in their office and a, a mindset where they don't need this kind of intimacy where you can email the person and say, I'm standing in Hudson in front of the shop window, yes or no. You know, somebody's going to do that job and they'll probably do a great job and they'll probably make a lot of money, but it just wasn't well, a that's, rope but I the client is probably then somebody who doesn't really care about design that much. So <clears throat> well, the point is, I don't know what they are. They yeah, make they no, may care more about their house than anybody. Right. But I don't. I didn't relate to one line item in the whole brief. Most of all, that there was no house, and this house was going to be acquired without my being consulted. You know, nobody's that mega that they don't need to hear exactly. from. They me. have to set their <laughs> feet on the ground at some point. Um, now, Gil, I wanted to ask you. We, we've been talking mostly about you know houses, but you both do tons of apartments, and you know, and especially in Manhattan or, but a lot of cities, Miami, when you're doing apartments and renovating apartments, the architecture was done a while back, you know, and often, especially new developments or whatever, the architecture isn't that great. I've had so many designers say to me, oh my God, I can't believe where they put the toilet. I can't believe where they put the door, the, you know. So how, how does, when you're coming in as an architect, working on another architect's building, mm -hmm. what is that like for you? Well, I, I mean, I my apartment experience isn't super extensive, but I, and it's mostly you know Upper East Side Manhattan where old, where right. there are old buildings that have great bones. I mean, you know, sometimes a window is in a funny place, but you know, <laughs> uh, and often we're gutting it. So um, you know, you know, you're kind of creating all the architecture. All you have is the windows where they are, and then of course the columns and whatnot mm -hmm. that you can't move. But right, right. Um, so it's a pretty open canvas to to work in. I so think. you just got them. Usually, usually we're gutting. I mean, not always, but right. often right. we are. Yeah. Right. And David, what about you? Because I'm sure you've been hired to work on some apartments that yeah. you know, ideal layout's not ideal, whatever. Um, the new ones have gotten better. Um, be largely because of Bob Stern and Peter Penoyer. Uh, apartment design in New York has gotten a lot better than when they started to say they were as good as the 20s in the 90s. Um, there was this uh, abysmal tall building on Park Avenue and like 59th Street that was sort of the second coming of allegedly of great New York apartment house design. And when you tried to gut that and lay out what the layout really should have been, um, there were all these pipes and risers and columns in the wrong places, and you couldn't you couldn't make it what they said it was. Uh, that building 
in a way, and all its mistakes, which were illuminated in a very um, adroit architectural review, I think by Paul Goldberger in The New Yorker. That apartment, that, that building was a disaster. And then the same developer built one Central Park West, whatever it is, that, you know, the, 15 the, the CPW, 15 Central yeah. Park West, right. But 15 Central Park West is when they got it right. And they worked with Bob Stern and they, and, and Bob is very uh, immersed in under in deep understanding of great New York apartment house architecture, both imagery wise and layout wise. And, and Peter is as well. Yeah. So, so those, those, there's now like a whole generation of those buildings that don't have the issues of the earlier ones, but there were some dogs and there's very little you can do about layout when the columns are in the wrong place. Except one trick I have is you can mirror the column and pretend it's not there. You can free it in the space of the room, clad it in mirror, <laughs> and then say it's the seventies. <laughs> Good advice. Good. But I hope you're not reverting to, you know, rust and, and brown for the color scheme. You know, let's not go all the way back. To well, maybe I am, Michael. What would you do? If <laughs> well, I'm sure you'd make it look good, David. So here's another question. Gil, your firm does do interiors and does beautiful interior work. So is it ever an issue for you what? When, the, when the client <laughs> comes to you and says, you know, I want you to design this house. I want you to design, you know, for me, but I, I'm going to hire X designer. Do you ever think, I mean, especially if it's somebody you don't know or you maybe don't regard that highly, is that something that you get resentful about? I, I try never to be <laughs> resentful, but, but in general. But um, uh, I think that- But there was this one time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think it's, it's always, I think you, uh, you know, in almost all cases, you, you learn something from collaborating with somebody. So I, I try to- approach those situations with a, a fair degree of optimism um, and excitement about the chance to work with somebody that you, did, you didn't know before and that you can learn something from and they have a, a point of view that's different from yours, hopefully, you know, aligned enough. And, and so um, I, I really welcome the opportunity to collaborate with other designers. I mean, when we, when we do interiors, it's a tiny department. We do maybe one or two projects at a time that's all we have the bandwidth for, and that's fine. It's just, it's really for when a client is doesn't have an idea about an interior designer or does, for some reason, is not going to hire a designer and we help them to kind of pull it together. Um, but it's it's really fun to to work with, to collaborate with somebody because you're you're just expanding your horizons <laughs> enormously by doing that. Uh, but I know one architect, who said to me he really wanted to do interiors and beef up his interiors department because he felt he would make a lot more money off doing the interiors for his firm than he would doing the architectures. Is, do you think that's true? Because that's, I mean, that's always the budget thing. You know, who where, who gets to spend the money? Right, the architect right. or the designer? And he was feeling that the designer with the markups and all that, that he was missing out on a lot of money. Yes. So David, I'm sure you don't necessarily agree with that. I am stonily silent over here. I'm <laughs> going to let Gil <laughs> well, ride this one I mean, right we, down into the. Uh, we certainly don't approach our interiors line. as a kind of profit <laughs> mechanism. <Cash cow>. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm sure that our business model is terrible, but um, you know, it's it's just not You're our not it's so not bad, our yeah. primary business. So we, mm -hmm. you know, we really just uh, we we don't have big markups and all that kind of thing. So uh, maybe for if we operated it differently, it might be, but. It's just not our approach. Um, so I, I don't, I don't see it as a, a, oh, I lost out on the big, you know, payday because we didn't do the decorating. Um, I just don't approach it that way. Uh, it's more, I'm more interested in what the final outcome is going to be uh, as, as the product. Uh, as an outside set of eyes, I aware of Gill's interiors department. Um, I would say that he's a gentleman, first of all. He does not have an aggressive agenda to promote himself as a decorator, although he is a very um, competent decorator. But he also has a voice when it comes to interior design. What Gil does decoration-wise looks like his architecture and goes beautifully with his architecture. 
And it's not like some huge range of ideas where he would do anything to get the decorating job and is trying to, I mean, where am I going with that? Gil, Gil, Gil wants to do decoration for people that want exactly what he does. He's not, he's not trying to dominate through his decorating. You have a look, so to speak. I, I guess. And, and one of the, you do. I mean, yeah. I think you do. But one of the first things he said to me when I was, uh, I don't know, I was starting on my own or I was worried I didn't have enough range when I was trying to do something was you said it's very important to have a voice in design. And I would say that Gil's voice in interiors is very aligned with his voice in architecture. But, you know, he does get excited about working in ways that offset that voice with other designers. Yeah, because that, whatever my point of view is, it's not a good fit for everybody. It's not the right thing for every project, every client. And, uh, you know, a lot of times it needs a completely different voice, you know. Well, you're also not French. <laughs> um, and there's like a thing where I've noticed French designers have a certain egotistical stature where they want to control the entire project. And they lose interest if there's an architect who's to stand up for themselves too much or something, you know? And I've, um, the, the, these can be the best designers in the world, but that's just how they feel about their uh, position in the, in the role in the project. And you don't have that attitude. And I, I, from what I know of you and of the French guys, they're very aggressive, eye-watering billers. And you are not, you know, you and I both feel that if you made 35% on your best day, that's a square deal, you know, and that I don't know what your fee structure is, but, you know, there's no opacity to um, my billing. Any client can see any, the cost of anything. And, you know, I came out of working for, for other people. That was the first decision I made about how to set up my business was I was not going to do all these mysterious fees and percentages. I was going to let anybody see what the net was and be happy with a percentage of the whole budget. And I suspect that your billing is very fair, Gil, and that people appreciate totally that. Totally transparent. I mean, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah it has Which to be. Which is more increasingly becoming the way of the world, thank God, because I think the world of architecture and design frightens so many people because, you know. Well, frightens and also needlessly annoys people. Right. You know, I, I know great projects with major names and clients that should have gone better and all this sort of pissant hourly, you know, and, and, and uh, billing having to do with site visits and stuff and unseen fees just annoyed them. You know, it's better to, to charge a bigger design fee up front than, than drip, drip, drip through the whole thing with uh, smaller unforeseen numbers. Because there is a certain fatigue that sets in for anybody no matter what they can pay, you know, um, when they go into years of these kinds of bills. Well, and it's shocking how many decisions have to be made. And I think one of the reasons they hire an architect and a designer, you guys in particular, is to help them, you know, make those decisions for them other than the major ones. You know, I don't think these titans of industry want to be worried about which toilet paper holder should go in the guest bathroom, you, would, you know? You would think, but then you get surprised but by then you, somebody. I'm sure there are people who are obsessive and want to know them. About yeah. that. I'm sure you're right, Gil. I'm sure you've dealt with that as well. Uh, I just don't want to bill them for every one of those kinds of yeah, conversations. Exactly. Exactly. I, I front load that into the design fee and think of it as, explain it up front as architectural consulting. Right, right, right. Now, I want to ask each of you, Gil, we'll start with you. When clients come to you and say, you know, I want to build a house in Greenwich or I want to build a house in the Hamptons or wherever it is, um, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Vermont, you know, places that you have done work. Right. Do they usually come to you with a designer in mind or do they ask you for recommendations? And David, I want you to answer this, too. But, you know, what do you do if a client comes to you and says, I have this, you know, I want to build sort of a georgian -y house, but I want to like, and then I don't know what, who to do for the interiors. Do you, because that put, I would think that could put you in an awkward situation. No, I actually, I think that's a, I mean, I think what I try to do is find out what their, what their style is that they're thinking about for their interiors, because just because it's a Georgian so-called house doesn't mean that, that they're not, they don't want David to kind of shake it up a little bit, you know, inside and make it young. So I, I, what I try to do is get them to send me 
pictures of things that they love or people that designers that they've seen or cut out of magazines that they love. And, and then I'll try to assess like, you know, what are the five people in that group that really seemed like a good fit for that, for the project. And, and I'll, I often am asked to recommend people. Um, and I try to do it with the sense of who's the best fit for this client and this project. Um, based on what they love, what they say they love stylistically. But, but Michael, what would be awkward about it? No, what I was saying, what I was wondering is if it de- I, I should have been better in my question, but, you know, let's say you recommend designer X. And so then this designer Y say, oh, I heard you recommended designer X. Why didn't you think of me? Oh, you just have to tell people to shut up who talk like that. There's, <laughs> you just, you know, if you're. If anybody who's any good is so busy in the last two years that well, nobody has year, time for true. those kinds of conversations, you that's know, there's true. plenty of work. Gil has a huge wait list. I can't get him to do the projects I wish he would do because he's busy, you know, and if people don't want to wait. And I, I mean, I unfortunately, I know very well you're right that there are lots of people that think like that, but you just have to, you know, move on. And you don't want to work I, with them on anyway. to the next thought. And I usually you know. give them, you know, X, Y, Z, and W, and I mean, I give them a, lo- a whole range right. of, exactly. of names. You're not going to so say that, you must work with this X no, person because no. that's no, that's not. I mean, the range of people you have worked with, Gil, and and you, David, as well. I mean, that's plenty to choose from. You know, I mean, yeah. you guys sort of covered the territory there with with the and that range for me consists of like four people that I go back to again and again. Um, cause I can't always work with Gil, uh, whether because of availability or, um, you know, if the project's not big enough, but, um, I do, I am loyal to, to the three or four other architects that I love to call. And I also know that they're, they're dependable, you know, right. I mean, and I, you get along with them and you're going right. to move the project <clears throat> along, Yeah, you know? Yeah. Right. And they understand yeah. your vision and what you were, what you're trying to do and, and how you're going to. Okay, here's another question for you, Gil. I'm not, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but, <laughs> you know, it is known that architects can be controlling, you know, and there's, you know, everyone from Frank Lloyd Wright to, you know, I mean, famously, you know, down to every pillow, every doorknob, every light switch, all of that. And it is kind of a thing. So my question to you is, when you're on well, a Frank project, Lloyd Wright was not <laughs> decorator friendly. <laughs> no, he was. And that's what I mean. He wanted to do everything. Yeah. And, and I understand... You are decorator friendly. Clearly, you've worked with, you know, such a the top talent. So, and like David said, he'd be thrilled to work with you more. Um, but at what point does the architect sort of let go of the project, as opposed to the designers, which I know often the client will call and say, you know, you need to send someone to change the light bulbs on my house right, or, or right. do my Christmas decorations. So, when do you think the architect's job is done? <laughs> well, you know, I was uh, I was thinking about this the other day because um, there's a kind of essential um, imbalance in the relationship between architect and designer in the sense that the designer gets to see the design, if they're, if they're on board from the beginning, they get to see and even influence the architecture all the way through. But I, I, I often don't get to see what the interior design is going to be. Although Dave, David's unusual in the sense that he always he has these does these beautiful presentations and he always shares them with our with me and my team so we have a understanding of where he's going with you know creatively um which i think really helps us architecturally um but not a lot of times we never know until the moving van shows up and then right. it's like oh you know or we saw the paint right. go on the walls we're like oh that room is yellow i had no idea you know um and and oh, that's interesting. so that I, I hadn't thought of that so we, you know, but but we obviously we have to carry the architecture part all the way through to the end. I mean, because you know, if the the door doesn't close, I mean, and and or whatever it is, you, you've got to make sure that it's working so that the decorator can come in and do their thing. Um, and I think that one of the advantages we have because we do a little decorating is we we kind of know the questions we should be asking of the decorator to make sure the architecture is helping them do what they need to do for example like window treatments and how how is the window treatment going to integrate with the window because we've we've had to think about that from the decorating side uh and and there's a lot of you know if, if the architect screws up the window so that you can't actually hang any window treatments on it 
that's a problem. Um, no, I have a friend who has a, a workroom and he does one and he says he's shocked how many times there's not enough depth for the right, rods right. or the equipment. You know, exactly. Like, so that's been a real advantage to, to because of our doing that kind of work ourselves. We know what questions we should ask and when we should ask them and, and try to get that information from the interiors person uh, so that it can be seamlessly integrated rather than like, oh, my God, I'm going to have to like drill curtain rods into that paneling. It doesn't work at all. And what am I going to do You know, at the last minute? I don't think I answered David, your question, but anyway. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's a it's a long process, but the architecture definitely is done at a certain point when the yes. designer moves in. Gil thought the architecture was done once and then he got a call asking where the trash enclosure was. Do you remember this? This was for a house in Florida while okay. you were still at the other firm where we both oh, worked. Okay. And and <laughs> and no one had the answer. Um and then, you know, if the if I've done a good job the decoration relationship is never over because the client will call me and ask what to wear to a party. You know, I it's it becomes a conversational friendship, and maybe that's less the case with architects and clients than with I, decorators I that, and clients. I think that's true. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, but uh, let me let me just sum it up by saying, without an architect of serious capability. It's very hard to to look good as a decorator. You know, you, I I give those people credit in the articles I write about our projects, collaboratively all day long. I'm very proud of promoting the architecture as the significant platform on which any de good decoration is um, is able to occur. And I make a point of it when I write because I, for for many years, you know, it was sort of a joke working for architects as I did in the beginning of my career when when projects would get published that the decorator got all the credit. And, you know, there was like a one line thing at the end or in a caption where they'd refer to the architect. And I just And that still goes I, on. <laughs> I'm sure that does go on, but not when not when I do projects and right. I have people to thank like Gil and and right. the, the other people that I depend on who make me look good. Right. Um so I want to ask you both, I'll start with you, Gil. What is your pet peeve about working with the designer or decorator or oh, what has been a pleasure and then david i want to know from you uh, art with uh, working with architects now of course present company excluded here. present company excluded um uh i think finding out uh way too late in the process that there's a new idea <laughs> um uh -huh. you know like um uh mantles for example we we always try to design um, the, the firebox in the chimney to fit the mantle. And so we, we try to front load those decisions early. And I've been on jobs where we're almost done. And then the, the, the mantle design photograph comes or the, the antique and it doesn't in any way fit the firebox. And you're trying to like figure it out. And, and, uh, you know, that, I say th those are kinds of things where if you could, if you, if you all could figure it out earlier, it would feel more seamless. Um, Gil, we found this in in England, and it's yeah, just so no, beautiful. It, no, it happens. Or, <laughs> Can't you make you know, it work? <laughs> you know, we had we went on this trip, and we came back with this thing. Yeah, and it happens all the time. And you have to you have to let those things happen because that makes a interior feel more connected to the client. I I get it, but anyway, <laughs> it's just a thing sometimes. <laughs> and David, what about you? What's your pet peeve working with architects? Well, I have to work with architects, so no, I, can't, I know, but I'm not saying it's it's I, perfect every single day. You're not going to. I can't that. afford to have a peeve because I need them. But <laughs> if I had one, if something <laughs> if comes up, one. yeah, if if there was a thing <laughs> that uh, when it starts to happen, I think is really annoying. Um, architects can have a completely different perception of what is actually important on a job and expend an enormous amount of time talking about that in ways that do not need to involve the decorator. They can just happen. But the architect feels that it's just as interesting to you, this unknown architect <clears throat> not included on the call. Um, and I do mean that. I mean, this Gil's not like this, but there. But I have met this where they want you to understand every <laughs> pro thought process they've had in coming. You'll to be this. summoned to a right. site where you have to travel half the day to get there, and you get there, and the meeting is absolutely a non-essential thing about 
you know, tile and how the the size of the tile joints determines how many courses of tile there are between the countertop and the upper cabinets. And, you know, they, they're, they're like living and breathing this problem. And it's simply, it doesn't have to be everybody's problem. I like a decorator who saves me time. I mean, sorry, an architect who saves me time. Yeah. You know, yeah. and knows what needs to land on my desk and what doesn't. And do you think that, and I'll, I'll go back to you, Gil. Do you think that it has gotten easier over the years that there is more understanding on the part of designers what an ar- what an architect does and should do? And do you think more of them are clear about your roles? I mean, it's, aside from, obviously you're going to collaborate and you want to work together, but, you know. Yeah, I think so. Do they so. know that Firebox size <laughs> has something to do with maybe with this imaginable I, size? I think so. I mean, I've been really pretty lucky in that I work with a lot of people who, for whom this is not their first rodeo and right. and they are very professional. So I, I think generally I've been pretty lucky about that. And, and it's also our responsibility to say, we're going to be thinking about this. You, you know, can you help us by, by giving them an, a, an agenda of like, we're going to, we're going to f- focus on this first. Can you put that, you know, in the front end of your agenda mm-hmm. with the client, you know, when you're thinking, you know, pick the mantles or whatever it is like, and David, I know you did that very early on in this project we're working on right now together where you, and I think we all together, we just said, look, the mantles are going to, we need to know what they are. And, you know, so Let's make that at the front end of things you're thinking about. Well, when you have a classical education, which more or less I do have, you know, via Parrish Hadley kind of vibrations of my early life, you do view the mantle as the intersection of architecture and decoration in the room. That's that's the mantle and the rug are the two conventional first steps when you're building a room. And so Gil and I would probably share that approach. Yeah. I think that's true. But, but David, have you ever got worked with an architect where you've gotten the drawings and you've like been like horrified? Like, oh yes. my God, everything's <laughs> in the wrong place? <clears throat> um, yes, I have. Um, <laughs> and it's not, it's sometimes not an architect who's alive. Mm-hmm. I, I right. have had somebody buy a house that was so bad that even though it was a multi-million dollar project, I asked them not to buy the house because I didn't know how to fix it, you know, and then they wanted the site. There was no other property like that. And they don't, they're efficient, you know, um, arrived at the right number and decided to make it my problem. And so that, that house, which actually wasn't built by an architect, but by a developer, yeah, developers um, are bad. a flip, a bad flip word. guy, you know, out here in, in, uh, Long Island, um, was 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 just a terrible terrible mess and so yeah i've had that i've had i've had one absolutely abysmal meeting with uh a somebody who was associated with the <clears throat> the the family was a real estate family and they had this guy in their life who like designed the lobbies of their buildings or something like that i don't know and so out of family dynastic tradition he was going to do the daughter's apartment and she had hired me as the decorator and i went to see this guy <laughs> And it was like Don Rickles or so, I mean, it was just so <laughs> bananas, the idea that I would work with this person, but nasty. He was incredibly nasty and sort uh, of making fun of me of and right. saying, what are you, a swatch picker? <laughs> you know, and <laughs> and I just, I left the meeting <clears throat> and I called the, the client and I just said, there's no way, <laughs> but I don't care at this point. It's so not possible to, to give you what you want. <clears throat> Sorry. If we work with this person, then I might as well just be completely honest with you and not try to get through three meetings and claim, you know, that that this isn't going that well. That guy cannot do your apartment. Now, if you want, you know, my advice, which is for free, um, you're going to hire this other person. And that was the end of that. They listened to me. If it hadn't gone that way, I wouldn't have done the job. I mean, I wouldn't have been able to do the job. It wouldn't have been that I was being petulant. You know, there was no doing that house for that with that person. Right. Right. And being able to say no is, you know, this to me, that's a definition of a success. You're able to walk away. You can see, you know, it's heading over a ditch and you get out of the car before it. Right. Right. Another way of saying no where you don't actually have to say no is when you say something three times 
And if someone doesn't say yes after the third time, you know that your suggestion is not going to happen. And so nobody has to sort of annoy anyone. You just take the psychological cue. I have those little backstops in all my standard conversations. And in the initial interview, if somebody's much more interested in their ideas than my ideas, I just think, well, they don't, they probably just don't need me. Yeah. And yeah. Um, they're, if they're not a great not listener, listen. and I don't think I'm going to get a lot of yeses because as, as much as I've been making fun of people with big egos in this conversation, um, I do feel that the, the more yeses I get, the better it looks. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. And I'm sure that's true, David. You know, I'm sure that. I mean, what else can I say to stand up for myself? But I will say that. Um, and if I just sense that this, this is going to be all of this, you know, Pinterest has not helped with that. I mean, there are people that, that used to come to a meeting and they had some clippings, they had a file they'd been worked on for years. But Pinterest has fire hosed us with completely, you know, it's like a wine cellar. There's like 5,000 bottles, but you really only want three of them, you know, and you have to manage to sort of um, structure the ideas that the person actually can use, but they don't, they don't know that they can't use all of them. And I would just say also that another thing about it is that it, it creates this um, fetishism about the past, especially when it comes to the glorious ghosts of Mangiardino, stuff that isn't really stuff that you can quote, you know, or do again. Right. And it doesn't work the, in America, you know, it doesn't or, work. Or it doesn't yeah. work with eight foot ceilings or it doesn't right. work, you know, right. whatever. Yeah. Exactly. Or it doesn't work because they don't, they, exactly. they, they don't want to use exactly. wicker, which is the other right. thing you have to do with things like right. that. Right. It's not just, I did a Mangiardino wall treatment. You have to do the next three things right, you know? Right. And I always, I like to say to clients, and I hope that, that it sort of wakes them up to the possibility, what are we going to add to these stories? You know, I know you love, you have the good taste to be putting these pictures in front of me. And I agree, these are wonderful rooms, but they are the past. And Pauline de Rothschild is, was a unique case of someone with an absolutely batshit creative, fearless, <laughs> and, you know, and you outlook. are not Pauline de Rothschild. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I, I don't make them feel bad about it, but no. I say, you know, what right. are we going to do that's, that's, as as for you to be important, because I want that for the for my clients. I don't want them to just live with all these quotes and death dealing sort of, you know, snapshots of great rooms of the past. I want them to add to those stories because I, I think we're in a sort of not great moment in American decorating because there's so little original thinking. And Gil, what would be the one thing that you wish more clients understood about what an architect can and should do for them? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I, I, I mean, I think they have to trust, uh, they have to trust us, <laughs> um, and, and, uh, that we're going to get the, the proportions. I mean, obviously they, they were going to get the, the layout, right. But, but also that the proportions and the details and, and, um, uh, and also that what I ha find that happens a lot is as the building's going up and David, I don't know if you've found the same thing, the, you'll get this panicked phone call. Like I've just walked into the site and the, the windows are too big or they're too small or the, the you know, and you, you, you try to explain to them that it's, it, it, it takes, you need all the other elements first to give it proportion and scale. And you have to have the faith that it's going to be okay. <laughs> and you can't have a heart attack you know, every time you go to the site and there's, you know, the, the incomplete picture in a new way, you've seen the incomplete picture. Um, so I, I think they need to That's really one of trust. the most time consuming aspects of the job. The, totally. the communications where you realize you, you must make time to talk to these people all the time so that they trust you and they know that your attention is such that whatever may be surprising them, you can explain how it's going to end well. And I think it's hard for people because, I, you know, if you look at an empty apartment, it's always going to look smaller than you think it is once there's furniture in there. But, you know, people forget those basic things, you know, scale, you know, scale, all well, of that I'm, stuff. Well, I'm going changes. right back to what I said before, where they say they knew it, but they don't know it. They don't. Know? Absolutely. Yeah. And they, they didn't have forget to... it. They never knew right. it. Right. 
And if I could do what they would do, I wouldn't do this either. If I could make plastic shower curtains and risk <laughs> arbitrage or whatever the hell is going on with that, you know, I, I don't need, uh, you know, to think this is such a great right. job. They have right. the great jobs. Right. But what the job right. is, is to know how to give them what they never knew they wanted. Exactly. You know, to, to, quote, to quote the great Albert Andrew. Hadley, without right. whom we would literally have nothing. Right. <laughs> exactly. Well, this has been so entertaining and informative. I really can't thank you guys enough. Um, so I want to thank Gil Schaefer. Thank you. David Netto. And thank everyone for listening to the Cherish podcast. <laughs>